Hey everybody, I'm Bob Baker with Jazz Guitar Today. Boy, that was exciting, wasn't it? <laughs> We're here. <laughs> and I'm here today with, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if 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 there is a, um, if there's a Hall of Fame for jazz journalism, you're, you're the first inductee. I don't know if there is or anything like that. We're here today with Bill Milkowski, who is literally the granddaddy, if you will, even though you're younger than me. My, is that you ringing my phone or something? Um, of uh, of jazz journalism. I mean, you've you've been with everybody, seen everybody, interviewed everybody, written for everybody, done liner notes. I mean, your resume, you know, and and in, in, in being the journalist for this genre is just unparalleled. It's it's incredible what you've done. Oh, I take issue with one thing you said. Uh oh. I'm not younger than you. Yes, you are. How's that possible? You're born in 1954. Really? Yeah. You're ancient. I am. A... <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah, I got you by a few years. I was born in 1950. Oh man, so you're older than Sco and I'm old. Yeah, I'm older. Jocko than older. and uh, yeah, Mike oh, Stern yeah. and all those cats. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kids. And you know, I, and, and here's the damnedest thing is I look up to them like I'm 14 years old. You know. I see. You know, yeah. The, like... the enthusiasm rubs off when I've seen your shows here. That's. Yeah. Uh, you're quite a fan. I am a fan. I'm a player too. I mean, I've got you know, uh, I've got probably seven guitars that are like within uh, reach of me. I I, I play professionally, uh, you know, still, and I did. I made my living doing it for years and years and years. Uh, I never got famous at it, but uh, but I still play, still sing. I was a voice major in college. I was a guitar major in college. I was an acting theater major in college. I was a business major in college. Never went, to, never went to medical school, Bill. But this isn't my interview. This is yours. Very accomplished, though. And what was that beautiful guitar you lifted up? Was it looked oh. like a D'Angelico, maybe? No, it's um, this is from Ryan Thorell. Oh, okay. Uh, Ryan, I, I've seen his. That's beautiful. Oh, it, it's absolutely stunning, and and it it, uh, you know, it just, it's just it's it's. I mean, I don't know how well you can hear it. You can hear it all, but it it's just an amazingly well balanced. Beautiful instruments, gorgeous woods. He, he... You're gonna have to uh, forgive me. My national, in, natural, instinctive tendency is to ask questions. So I'm curious about you. Like you've had this lifelong association with guitar. Did you have a older brother, sibling, or parent that turned you on to the instrument? Because I did. My older brother, four years older. I inherited every guitar he tossed away. So that was my bridge into this world. What was yours? Did you, well, I, I, before I answer that question, um, let me ask you a question. So did you pursue it professionally? I never saw that in any of the things I've read about you. I mean, I, I did gigs, I got paid for gigs, but I wouldn't say that it was a, you know, career for me. I did many gigs. I grew up in Milwaukee. I played gigs there and uh, I moved to uh, New York in 1980. I did some gigs around there. Uh, uh, and then I moved to New Orleans in 93 and played down there. So I've always played um, for my own enjoyment, also in public and jamming a lot, sort of the equivalent of uh, former uh, high school basketball stars playing pickup basketball on the weekend in their- right. 60s you know they're still playing with enthusiasm and love but uh i'm still doing that but never attempted to forge a career because my interest in music sort of dovetailed with my training in journalism the two took off through a freak beautiful bit of serendipity that landed me a, a job with a daily newspaper reviewing music and interviewing these people so i kind of took off you know, combining my love of music with my interest in training in journalism, and that I went on to that path. Tell us about that a little bit. Um, I, you know, I I I've been through your, uh, you, you know, your your bio and all that stuff, but I, I don't know. I don't remember recalling seeing much about that. Um, so how how did you, how, how did that happen? That you were, uh, I I know that you're a guitarist because I actually saw some of you know, the stuff, but. And I know that you were a journalism major in Wisconsin, uh, I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, 
And and I, I got all that, but I didn't see how a nice guy like you got into a business like that. <laughs> a business like this uh, the, the the lucrative profession of freelance lucrative. writing yeah there oh you go. <laughs> uh okay let me uh let me break it down for you yeah uh my interest in music and guitar in particular was really from the time i got my first guitar at age 12 uh handed down it was a har harmony rocket handed down guitar. to me fr from my brother tom who was playing he was playing professionally in bands and so i inherited every guitar that he tossed away including a very nice i wish i had it now hagstrom swede the kind that had the switches instead of the uh the, the tone and volume so who, who that had who, those switches who played that uh, guitar do you remember did coriel play that Corey for a while? L. Corey uh, I i love that guitar and i don't know what happened to it Anyway, uh, you know, and he turned me on to a lot of pre-Beatles guitar stuff. Uh, Dwayne Eddy, Link Ray, uh, you know, the Shantays had that song Pipeline. Uh, and then there was this cat that was very obscure. I don't know if you know his name, but he had a big hit in 1961 with Apache. And yeah. He, and it was an Atco single. My brother still has the 45. And he was uh, Danish, and yep. his name was Jorgen Ingman, right? Yeah. So this guy, strange <laughs> name, has a hit on the U.S. charts in 1961. And, you know, I remember hearing it through my brother, who was interested in instrumental music at the time, uh, uh, Ventures, Walk, Don't Run, all that stuff. But I checked it out the other day, and there's sophisticated harmonic, false harmonics right. on the intro, it's very advanced stuff. Uh, similar stuff to what Chet Atkins was doing at the same time with false harmonics and the bells of St. Mary. So anyway, I'm getting an education through my brother. At the same time, my father is a fanatical Chet Atkins fan. He's got every Chet Atkins record. And he comes <laughs> home uh, from work and he puts on Chet, At Chet Atkins. And so our house was flooded with this amazing guitar from Chet Atkins. And then my brother is feeding me pre-Beatles, pre-Stones, instrumental music. Uh, and then, of course, when the Beatles and Stones came out, I, through him, gravitated toward that. Uh, the first record I bought with my own money was uh, Hendrix's Are You Experienced? And sort of that got me off onto this other route rather than riff-based guitar, more I, I gotta stretching. Stop, I got to stop you there for one second because I, when you said Are You Experienced? So Yesterday, somebody put up a, a, a post on Facebook and said, what is the one album that you feel everybody should listen to? And normally I ignore that kind of stuff. And my answer to that was, are you experienced? Go ahead. That was mind blowing. It opened yeah. my head up in ways and it sort of put me on a divergent path from my brother who was into instrumental uh, rock. And, and uh, also by that point, the Beatles and Stones, and he had his own groups and playing at CYOs and later nightclubs. But I got off into this sort of uh, virtuosic thing on the instrument through Hendrix. Uh, and then in uh, that that record came out in 67, Are You Experienced? Mm -hmm. um, uh, Axis, I think, came out at the end of that year. Yeah. Uh, I was so into Hendrix. And then Jeff Beck came out with truth in 69 or 68 i'm sorry but the same year for me more importantly was um harvey mandel's Cristo redentor which was this incredible bridge between that rock virtuosity and jazz a jazz a stretching aesthetic i mean of course hendrix mitch mitchell was playing elvin jones on uh third stone from the sun and on if six was nine but uh, Harvey Mandel was stretching it into a, a jazz vein that was completely new to my ear, and it kind of in, in, intrigued me. He was uh, a bridge for me, as was Zappa. Uh, you know, around the same time I was hearing yeah. uh, Zappa also in concert, and the stretching aesthetic on the instrument opened my mind up to things that led me ultimately to Wes Montgomery and Joe Pass, and this whole other jazz world. So, uh, you know, Beck and Harvey Mandel, 
Hendrix, Zappa, they were the gateway drug into jazz for me. <laughs> you know, uh, you mentioned my favorite drummer of all the drummers out there, and that's Mitch. 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 Yeah, he's amazing. You know, I got to see him at a NAMM. I was in the uh, audio rep business for 30 years, and I went to every NAMM show up, up until about three or four years ago. And, um, you know, he was jamming at at nam one of the you know one of the events it was bootsy collins on bass oh shit and uh jeff berlin played bass too you know they okay. they, jumped, they jumped in and uh coriel played guitar and somebody else i can't remember all the, but but anyway i just couldn't couldn't stop watching mitch mitchell listen i just i just think he's the greatest drummer of all time i love him i absolutely love him yeah it, just listen people at home listen to if six was nine yeah. And tell me if you, if you don't hear Elvin's over the bar line aesthetic going on. Yeah, I just that, absolutely love incredible. him. It's funny you, it's, we, we've got so many parallels. So anyway, I'm I'm cultivating this interest in guitar, in guitar virtuosity. Um, uh, you know, strangely, my father, who was into Chet Atkins, and I, I sort of memorized every album because he played him so much. He called me. You know, I was in my bedroom one night, and he calls me into the living room to see some guy on TV. He's like, Bill, come out here. You won't believe this guy. It was that PBS documentary on Roy Buchanan. Oh, wow, yeah. In 1972. So my father, the Chet Atkins fan, turned me on to Roy Buchanan. Filthy Teddy. That, that was a whole other avenue that I was pursuing, you know. Uh, I was. Uh, I, loved, I loved Roy Buchanan. I was so all these things, I'm cultivating all these things. And at the same time, uh, by the time I go to college, I... I'm a journalism major, right. so I'm studying who knows what to become a newspaper guy. I don't know. I, I got an internship with the Milwaukee Journal, the daily newspaper, in 1976, and on an internship, they give you a taste of everything, the court beat, the police beat, the uh, copy editing. You know, you get like a week at every uh, position at the newspaper to check out all the functions Right. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I still had an ongoing interest in music and played guitar for my own enjoyment and jamming and stuff. But I didn't know, am I going to follow journalism? Am I going to be a newspaper guy? So just the, I mentioned serendipity. So that summer of 76, uh, a friend of mine uh, who was handling the feature department, in the feature department, he was handling all the record reviews and interviews, concert reviews. He had the primo gig. Uh, he had a column of writing about stuff happening uh, in town on the weekend. Action Unlimited was his column. <laughs> he ends up getting busted, oddly, horribly, for raping a girl. Oh, shit. And he, and he goes to jail. And so they come to me and say, do you want, do you want to do this? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the beginning because my friend went to jail i i could have ended up being a police beat reporter uh, anything but because this guy went to jail horribly and he ended up he went to fox uh lake correctional institute where he played chess with ed gein one day who was the uh, role model for the texas chainsaw massacre okay. uh this is pre-Dahmer. Wisconsin's got a lot of horrible cannibals. Um, anyway, I ended up, suddenly I find myself covering all the music from Dolly Parton to Kiss to, you know, Chet Atkins. I interviewed him, uh, Barney Kessel. Anybody who came to town, I was reviewing and interviewing. And suddenly I'm building up a resume of doing that. Um, that began in 76 and I ended up leaving town, moving to Milwaukee in 1980. So I did it for quite a few years. And over the course of that time, I interviewed many people, uh, James Brown and Keith Jarrett, uh, man, Bunky Green, a great uh, alto player from Chicago. Uh, many people, uh, Joe Pass, uh, uh, got to review these concerts and interview them. And it I sort of uh, wanted to check out New York. I went in 1980 and stayed there for about 40 years. Now I'm living in West Hartford, Connecticut. I moved here right before the pandemic, and it was another bit of serendipity because 
uh, three of the doormen I had at my building on 181st and Riverside in Washington Heights died within the first month of uh, COVID, oh, you know, and that very possibly could have been me too. Yeah, wow. Uh, same happened to Hal Wilner, the great producer. He died in that first month. Um, and uh, just about everyone attending his AA meetings died. You know, it was like, whoa. And when that hit, it reminded me of when I was, um, I, w I came to town in New York. I actually got hired and was flown to town for an interview and accepted this job as managing editor at Good Times Magazine in Long Island, which yeah. was a uh, entertainment publication that came out uh, every week. And uh, through that, I got to interview many more people, Zappa, McLaughlin, a whole bunch of people. And uh, for two years, I saw every Broadway play uh, reviewed that, you know, including the eight hour Nickel, uh, Nicholas Nickleby with a dinner break and on and on, man. Uh, so that brought me to town uh, in 1980. Uh, and I finally left and began freelancing in um, uh, 82, late 82. And I've been doing that ever since. <laughs> you yeah. know, and I think about that, the, the, doing writing for this long, I've gone through every vehicle that there was available, manual typewriters, then the Selectric with the little ball that you could put on to have a different font. Yeah. And then Whiteout, of course, uh, invented by Mike Nesmith's mother, right. uh, little known uh, factoid for yeah. Jeopardy. Uh, you know, and then uh, uh, what's the stuff that the tape that you would put on and correcting and for this electric and finishing a story, putting in an envelope, driving it across the bridge from Queens into Manhattan to drop it off at FedEx, you know, to get to downbeat in time. And now you just push a button and it's there. Amazing. <laughs> it's extended my career considerably. <laughs> hey man, thank you so much for going through that with us. I really appreciate it. That's, that's incredible. That's, a, that's an incredible story. It, it really is. If it wasn't for that guy doing that nasty thing to his ex-girlfriend in a boat oh. in Lake Michigan, uh, my friend who went to jail, I probably would be, you know, married with 10 kids and uh, being a, a court reporter today in Milwaukee. Who knows? Who knows? So let's talk about, thank you, man. I really, I appreciate that, Bill. I, I really do. Thanks for going through that. Let's talk about some of the specific guitar players that, we, you and I um, had a little conversation um, last week about what we were going to talk about. And um, we decided that we were going to try to do this more than once because you got, you got so much to talk about. I got a million of them. I know you do. I, I That's the thing. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm just a kid from Buffalo, New York that decided that jazz guitar needed a, a shot in the arm because just jazz guitar was gone. And uh, there was nobody talking about it. You know, I mean, very few people, relatively speaking, talking about it. And so, but I don't well, know. I don't know shit about what. Looking at the recent weather in Buffalo, New York, I fully understand why you moved to Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. Well, because that, that shit is ridiculous. It's I prehistoric, have, man. Yeah. I still have family up there and, uh, and uh, they, uh, they, they keep me apprised. Apparently, I, I don't know right what's going on right this very second, but apparently it stayed on the south side um and didn't go up get up into the northern burbs but i'm not that was yesterday i don't know what's going on there today yeah it's uh it's it's a real deal it it, it doesn't get that cold up there mm. compared to minnesota compared to um you know some of those northern regions uh but because of the lake effect and you I, everybody knows what that is because of the lake effect they get dumped on i mean they get right dumped on, and whether it's rain or snow or whatever terrible so, so um which guitar player would you like to start with Oi, um, I guess Pat Martino would be a good place to start. Uh, how about Wes Montgomery? Go for it. Only, yeah, that, only because it. I've done recently for Zev Feldman, I've done some liner notes yeah. uh, on a release that's come out, which is, uh, yeah. Now, wait a minute. Check that out. You were just playing octaves. Yeah. It's interesting to note that of course that was Wes's signature, right? That's his signature, but he did so much 
beautiful cig- his playing is incredible I, i'll tell but you it, but it's interesting to note how big of an influence that was if you listen to hendrix third stone from the sun yeah da, 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 yeah. that's octaves yeah the last tune he played at woodstock a uh, villanova junction totally octaves all over the place yeah Stevie Ray Vaughan, Villanova, uh, what was it? No, Riviera, Riviera Paradise. Yeah. Octaves. Yeah. So that Wes, you know, obviously he affected uh, Coriel and Schofield, Matheny, uh, everybody, but rock players too. Oh, yeah. Uh, with that octave thing. Well, uh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say this. And then I'll, 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 when, when I was transcribing stuff for school and I transcribed some Wes stuff, all the other musicians that I transcribed made sense to me. I mean, I got it, you know, from physically, from a guitar player, I got it where, why they did what they did. The two guitar players that didn't make any sense to me at all. And I went, cause there were, there were, was Wes because of the musicality of everything. He was thinking music. Now a lot of guitar players play physically, you know, they, they play with their eyes and they, and they view with their eyes. Um, and Django, of course, because he had two fingers and his technique was complete. But, um, Man, he, his his octave playing is what he's known for, but that's one, as you know, that's one twentieth of what he actually did. I mean, you know, his intuitive chord melody playing is so unbelievable. Uh, not only the facility of it, but the speed of his mind to even conceive of that shit, let alone cover it, like just instinctively. And that's what's so exciting about this new record that I did liner notes for, Maximum Swing. It's the um, previously unheard stuff from the half note like the next week the famous smoking at the half note uh came out on verve and uh what you might not remember is only three of those tunes were really at the half note the rest of it was recorded in the studio at van gelder's but this new release that is come out on resonance uh which zev feldman has put out uh contains uh unadulterated sort of jamming tracks at the half note the following week, following uh, consecutive Mondays. Uh, Bob Grant, the uh, host of a, a Portraits and Swing, a radio show on WABC, uh, was broadcasting. And so this, these particular nights, Wes and the uh, Witten Kelly trio were playing a gig at the half note with no idea that it was going to be a recording. So they were stretching. They're playing 16-minute versions of impressions, you know, and they're stretching <laughs> out on four on six. And you hear Wes, and it's like, because with the mindset of, yeah, we're doing a recording, he's going to self-edit right. and make these tunes come in three, four, five minutes. Right. With no constraints and no idea that it was going to be recording. Right. He's just like, he's he's he starts out with single notes, he goes to the uh, octaves. He goes to the chord melodies. He's doing 200, 300 bars of soloing, <laughs> you know, uninterrupted, flowing without repeating himself. And as a listener, like, you know, I don't know the average person, but guitar fans yeah. are on the edge of their seat going, how's he going to finish this? How is he going to get out of this? <laughs> Holy shit. It, 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 he's still going. And he's not repeating himself. It's it's an unbelievable arc of genius. And that's what I'm talking about. This, you know, perhaps the most genius thing of Wes was his brain to come up with, to think of these things and then execute them. But just his brain, his mind was so accelerated to be able to come up with these uh, brilliant uh, single note octaves, chord melody playing, stretching on these solos all in context is remarkable and so that album go check it out maximum swing totally we, exhilarating for we, guitar fans we need to get the link from the record company yeah it's oh, it's remarkable and it's not uh smoking at the half note part two because like i say yeah. it's just unadulterated un, unabashed jamming and what's they're it killing again? it what's it called maximum swing uh what's the subtitle uh previously unissued tracks from the half note uh man it's just thrilling i was uh listening to this music you know uh, zev called me to do liner notes and as i'm listening to it 
like I say, I'm on the edge of my seat. It was thrilling music to hear, uh, having already known about the smoking at the half note and how great that was. I think Matheny called it the greatest guitar album ever. Oh, yes, yeah. But but this strip for the stretching aesthetic for guitar aficionados, it's unbelievable and it's unbelievably exciting. Uh, so Wes, you know, and you mentioned Pat Martino, of course, Pat's coming right out of Wes right, as of is Benson, you know, and so like, you know, the, the, the daddy of those two guys is Wes Montgomery and they took it somewhere else. I mean, I still listen to, uh, 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 Benson's the cooker on it's uptown coming out of the gate on that first solo on that first track. It's mind blowing still, you know, and it's, the facility, the ingenuity, the melodic and just breathlessly seamless extrapolation on a theme is breathtaking. And of course, Pat had the same same story. And to think of, of how Pat and Benson were friendly rivals on the same turf back in the day, you know, around the time of McDuff and all that. And yeah. Like they were like, you know, challenging each other, but equally respectful of each other and right. uh, uh that that was an incredible moment in time for the guitar uh pat once told me a story of let's see he he was playing oh man a gig in harlem with mcduff and then afterwards he went over to see grant green playing somewhere and and uh oh benson came in to see pat uh with mcduff and then they both went to see grant green and wes was there and then they all they all went out for breakfast afterwards and it's like you know here's wes montgomery <laughs> pat martino grant green george benson sitting in a, a chicken and waffles place at <laughs> six in the morning to four greatest you know what a hang that must have been uh you know and what a time that was for guitar well, you know, in 1964, I'm looking at it right now, George's first record was called The New Boss Guitar. Yeah, but It's Uptown is the one. Oh, that's I, the one I that's... know. That's, not, that's 66. Yep, that's it, man. The first track, The Cooker. Play it. Yeah, I, I got into him a little bit later. I got into him with, um, I had Beyond the Blue Horizon, White Rabbit, Body Talk, oh, yeah. Bad oh, yeah. Benson. Oh, yeah. I had all of those records. And, all the uh, CTI stuff with Ron Carter and... Yeah. Cobham was on some of that, right? Yep, yep, yep. That's that's the stuff that I just oh, uh, I just couldn't get enough of it. I just and then of, of course I bought Breezin in '76, and I thought, what the hell, is Stevie Wonder doing singing on this on this track? Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, I mean, we complain about that shit, but he's oh, still no, no, playing. I, I He's was, still playing his ass off. Oh, Go no, see no, him no. live, you know. No, no, no. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't mean it as a negative. I really didn't. I thought. I thought it was brilliant. But I thought, man, what a voice! I thought that that's Stevie Wonder's on the track. I, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. I'm not a negative. I, I, I don't. I want to take that and re. No, I was blown away. That's a great record. That's a great record. And and the fact that he can sing, that he could sing like that, just totally shocked me because I was a voice major in college. You know, one of my majors was it was voice, and um, and the fact that he could sing like that, just I mean, Stevie Wonder, I was you know I, I, I was used to that, you know, but I, I just that's that's what I thought it was. Of course, their voices are very different when you listen now today, but that's the first time anybody ever heard George sing that I'm aware of, you know, on a recording, and it just absolutely floored me. And um, that was that was kind of it for me. I just you know I I. I, I'm a huge George fan, uh, you know, from that era, if you will. But you know, I understand he's got a new record coming out. I just saw a little trailer for it. You should get him on the show, man. I, I need to do that. You know, I yeah, I don't know him at all, and I really don't know how to get a hold of him. Uh, if you can help me with that, I would appreciate it because I would, you know, he's he's if 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 I have a guitar hero, uh, it's him. Uh, you know, he's, 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 I just, uh, you know, I just, I mean, Wes, I love Wes, but, but George was a little bit more contemporary for me. I mean, he's older than I am, but, um, what he was doing that, you know, the, the, the bluesy funky thing that he was doing and all of that. And, right. and Phil Upchurch, of course, doing his thing, uh, you know, just that. Well, and, and the latter day Grant Green records were funky. Oh, I love, know, yeah, I love in that, that vein. Yeah. 
I, but for some reason, I just, I just, I, I love Grant. Don't get me wrong. I mean, these, these are the, you know, these are the the guys, you know. Um, but George was, I, I would love to, I would love to get George. Um, He's very sweet and forthcoming in the interview. You'd find him talkative and and nice, and he's just a killing player still. Uh, oh, yeah. I actually interviewed him when he did that Chuck Berry record. That was great. Did, did you know that one? Where I he did not. a lot of he did a lot of Chuck Berry. It was like a tribute to Chuck Berry, and he's singing and all those tunes, and totally got that. You know, beautiful. But uh, I, one time I was in a studio. Oh, it was a Benny Golson session. Uh -huh. And Benson Benson came in to appear on one track, right? And uh, everybody's there waiting for him. He comes out of, you know, leaves his car, comes in with his guitar. Before he takes his coat off, he's so excited. He opens his guitar. He's like, check this out. Look at this chord Prince just taught me. Uh -huh. <laughs> and he plays this voicing that's like, and he's like, well, oh, this is so cool. Prince just taught me this chord. <laughs> uh, another another time uh i was i was producing this that pat martino record i produced in 96 uh um uh, all sides now is first blue nut recording and uh, bruce lundvall uh the head of blue note uh called me up i was living in new orleans at the time and he's like uh I'll try to do my Bruce Lundvall imitation. Bill Lad, ha, ha, I want you to come and produce this record. We signed Pat Martino, and I want it to be, uh, you know, he wanted a all-star with a different guest on each track, like a tribute to Pat right. by yeah. other guitar players. So he wanted me to round up a bunch of guitarists to play on that track. And uh, naturally, I approached George Benson. Oh, and wow. the way I did that was I showed up at Bradley's one night because I knew he he hung out there a lot. So yeah. uh, uh, Bradley's, of course, was the long defunct uh, uh, jazz club on University that, you know, people after their gigs would show up at that place. Oh. So um, Bruce Lundvall wanted me to do this recording, produce this recording, tribute to Pat Martino. And the, one of the first guys I thought of was... George Benson. So I right. figured uh, I would try to approach him in a novel way rather than through a manager or a phone call or whatever. Uh, you know, virtually no internet at the time, not for me anyway. Yeah. But um, so I went to uh, Bradley's, which was this great late night jazz club on University Place where all the musicians hung out after their gigs. They would congregate at Bradley's and usually there till four or five in the morning. So, uh, and I know that uh, Benson went there a lot. So I went on a hunch one night and sure enough, I, you know, I went to the bar and uh, suddenly I looked to the right, there's Cecil Taylor and to the right of me, to the left of me is George Benson. So I just kind of <laughs> went for it. I just kind of went for it. And that was the type of people that hung out there. Art Blakey was there every night, you know, people were, the audience was all musicians and it was a great, amazing place to be. So, I saw Benson and I just said, I'm going to go for it. So I <laughs> very forwardly said, George, I'm producing this record for, by, uh, for Blue Note, Pat Martino, for Bruce, Bruce Lundvall. Uh, you know, how about do you want to play on it? Uh, and he looks at me and he's drinking cognac, of course. And he says, man, any guitarist would be a damn fool to get in the ring with Pat Martino. So, <laughs> so essentially, essentially, he blew me off. Uh, didn't happen, but we did get uh, a lot of other great players. Uh, interesting story about that project. We we had gotten uh, Kevin Eubanks, Mike Stern, Charlie Hunter, mm -hmm. Joe Satriani, uh, Michael Hedges, Tuck Michael Andrews. Hedges. Yeah, we w we flew out to Marin County to. He recorded uh, at his studio in Marin County, um, tracks with himself, Michael and Pat playing duets, and then Satriani came by and he recorded uh, uh, tracks with Pat and uh, Satriani playing. Uh, and then he had like a converted school bus in his front yard, which he had converted into a uh, sensory deprivation tank that he would go into in between tracks. 
in the water, like altered states, like lying there and doing his hippie thing in the sensory deprivation tank. <laughs> anyway, so that so that was a, a project that uh, including so included so many players, and one of which, who was supposed to be on the album, was uh, Pete Townsend. Oh, and wow. uh, Pete was a great fan of Pat, and had actually uh, written a song for him to play on this album. Uh, this was during a week long engagement at Madison Square Garden with the Who playing at Madison Square Garden. So they're going to be in town for a week. And we set it up to do a recording um, during the afternoon of their engagement at uh, Madison Square Garden. So Pat comes to town. He lives in Philly. He comes to meet Pete Townsend at his suite uh, near Central Park. And Pete's got a piano in there. And he susses out the tune. He's like, well, here it is. It's on paper. And then he's playing it. And it's running it down, I think you could come in here. We'd do the call and response, whatever. And uh, so Pat's down with it. And we're going to do this recording for this record. We book a studio. And the day of the recording, uh, my co-producer, Matt Reznikoff, was going to pick Pat up at his home in Philadelphia. And Pat had a sudden change of heart. And wow. he says... And he says, and this is my invitation to Pat Martina, you tell Pete Townsend, I don't kiss rock star ass. If he wants to play with me, tell him to come to Philly. Click. So that didn't happen. <laughs> that track did not happen. I'm sorry. It, I, I, I love your impersonation of him. <laughs> oh, here's another one i'll do another one rest in peace pat i love you however let me do another pat martino invitation so one of the people we had on that album was cassandra wilson and this was bruce lundball's suggestion cassandra was very popular at the time on the label she was on the roster and bruce wanted to have her be on this record so we envisioned this duet between pat and cassandra doing Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now. Yeah, Rose, which, Rose uh, Mitchell which, there. Which uh, Pat had already recorded as a solo guitar piece on his great 1975 album, Consciousness. It ends the album. The uh, album opens with the uh, train's impressions and it closes with Joni's Both Sides Now. A very beautiful, very gentle, hymn-like approach to that tune. So we figured it's a natural. Uh, we got together for a little rehearsal. I had sent Pat the music and he learned it. And when, when uh, we got together the night before, Cassandra's like, uh, oh, I can only sing it in D. And Pat had learned it in in E. Or So all he did was he tuned down a step. He tuned all his entire guitar down a step. So if you hear that track, it's unusually low sounding. And that's just the E turned down to a D, tuned mm -hmm. down to a D. But the point I was getting to in my Pat Martino imitation, when we first broached this topic at the suggestion of Bruce Sunball, Pat, you know, she sells a lot of records. She's very popular right now. Pat's response was, I didn't come back from the fucking dead to record with fucking Cassandra Wilson. So... But we were able to cajole him, and we got it. We got it on that uh, album. He didn't know who she was, and in some cases, he said because of the because of the aneurysm. In some cases, he said, "If I knew him, I don't remember him." Uh, this was the case with a couple of players. Um, you know, some visited him in the hospital. Uh, Satriani visited Pat in the hospital after his aneurysm. Uh, Satriani uh, has an interesting background. He studied with uh, Lenny Tristano in Long Island. Uh, so he's very harmonically advanced having studied with Lenny. But uh, what he and Pat did together was purely improvisational. And I think it worked out great. But yeah, you know, Pat didn't know half the players, or if he had, the aneurysm wiped out his memory of these people. So it was rather tough given that he was used to recording an album in a day or two days. 
with a band that was a working group. This was a different city. Every track was a different city with people who we may or may not have ever played with or known. Uh, the very sweet uh, cherry on that cake was the track with Pat's uh, boy and hero, Les Paul. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful and also funny because, uh, you know, Pat played, Pat's father kind of dra dragged him around to the barbershop. Hey, check it out. My kid can play. And he's playing tunes for, uh, for his buddies and uh, did the same to Les. They went to a gig in Atlantic City and uh, uh, Pat's father uh, approached Les Paul and is like, check my boy out. He can play. He's really for real, you know? And so Pat played for, you know, young 12 year old Pat Martino played for Les Paul and Les was amazed by his right hand picking technique and was very impressed. He made a note of it later when he wrote liner notes for a Pat record. He reminisced about how stunning that right hand was for a 12 year old kid. So to get them together for this track was uh, a beautiful, uh, beautiful thing. And what happened was I, had, at that time, Les had a regular Monday night gig at Iridium. Uh, and I would go often to see them play. Paul Nowinski was on bass and Lou Paula was on rhythm guitar. And they ended every set with the same tune, Caravan. And it was great. And they had their little set arrangements with dropouts and fills by Les. And I thought, let's do that tune. That he, They got it. The trio's got it. We'll bring them in. We'll send Pat the music. He can learn it. And they'll just, they'll do that tune. So, you know, I faxed Pat the music. That's how long ago this was. And uh, he was fully prepared to play Caravan. We show up at the studio in Midtown. Uh, they plug in. Everybody's tuned up, ready to go. And Les turns to Pat and he goes, you know this one? And he starts playing, I'm confessing that I love you. And Pat just jumped in and they play it. And that was it. We had a first take and it was beautiful. <laughs> you know, so we did not play Caravan. It's I I'm confessing, and it's it's heartwarming. It's one of the great little uh, gems on that record. I was so tell people the name of that involved. record. It's called All Sides Now. It's on Blue Note. Yeah, it came out in '97. Yep, and uh, you know, uh, Kevin Eubanks was on the Tonight Show at the time, and we flew to L.A. and he did a a duet with Pat playing acoustic guitar that was very killing. And Charlie Hunter came down and played uh, Stevie Wonder's Too High. That was a beautiful session. And uh, like I mentioned, Tuck Andrus and Mike Stern. Uh, man, it was it was great fun. And Cassandra fucking Wilson. It was great. She was, <laughs> she was beautiful, man. Her, it was so hauntingly beautiful. Uh, if you listen to that track, it's still I get chills when I hear that. Um, yeah, so that was, you know, although my relationship with Pat goes back relationship, but my, I, uh, made his acquaintance in, uh, 76 when, uh, Joyous Lake came out. I think it was 76. Uh, love that record. 77. Um, uh, I, yeah, I love that record too. And I was full blown into fusion by that point, you know, having, uh, loved, uh, Billy Cobb's Spectrum and, Chikoria's uh, Where Have I Known You Before and all that. And my, of course, Ma Vishnu, Birds of Fire and everything. Uh, so I was determined when I heard that Pat was going to be playing in Madison, uh, the capital city of Wisconsin, and home of that uh, giant uh, 50,000 population university, I was determined to go see him. And I thought I was driving the 60-minute uh ride to from Milwaukee to Madison went with my friend Rick thinking that it was going to be Joyous Lake and that the full-blown band with Ken Wood on drums and Delmar Brown on keyboards and Mark Leonard on electric bass but when we got there it was not a arena or a big rock club it was a restaurant and uh Pat was playing uh duets with Bobby Rose we walk into the place and they're playing four on six, you know, and I had a tape recorder and I recorded it. I still have the cassette and uh, 
<laughs> you know, we 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 listen to the set of burning two guitar stuff. Uh, uh, man, it was killing. I approached Pat afterwards, and he was very forthcoming and generous with his time. We had a nice chat, and then he says, "Why don't you come back to the hotel, and we'll have it. We'll continue our chat, right?" So I went back to the hotel, and we talked for another ninety minutes, and I taped the whole thing. This is in 1976, and uh, that tape was passed around to all the guitar players in Milwaukee who were advanced uh, fusion kind of players, and it was a, a popular thing because Pat was philosophizing about the analogies about the waves of the ocean on the fretboard and the five-pointed star and all these things that were so hard above over my head at the time, but I was just mesmerized by him so I was pleased to get that interview. And then, you know, not too long after that, he had his aneurysm and began making his comeback in the early 80s. Um, I attended a gig, I think it might have been 83, where he opened for Stanley Clark at the bottom line. And this was a big comeback uh, for him, a visibility thing. He had been playing under the radar up until that under his actual real name, Pat Azara, low yeah. profile gigs around Philly and Cape May, uh, you know, on the sandwich board outside the club tonight, Pat Azara, you know, he was making a low profile return to the scene after the recovering from that aneurysm. And so this night, Stanley Clark, who was also a Philly guy uh, and Pat played on his very first record, uh, what was that called? Children of Tomorrow or something? Uh, he has Pat open for him. And that was the beginning of his real comeback. And then, of course, uh, a couple of years later, he played at Fat Tuesdays with Joey Barron and Steve Lespina. And that was recorded uh, live and released uh, on high note as uh, the return. And, uh, you know, I reacquainted myself with Pat at that gig and Ended up doing liner notes for a couple other albums. Uh, did this recording of the All Sides Now in 96. And then, you know, maintain a friendship with him over time. Got, come to his gigs and go to Philly and hang out with him. And then in 2011, he asked me to write, to write his uh, autobiography with him. So that began a process of me jumping on a train, going to Philly. He'd pick me up in his Cadillac and drive home. We'd sit in his living room for four hours and chat, uh, take a dinner break, go out somewhere, come back, do three more hours. And I did maybe four or five of those and got a book out of it, which is his autobiography. It's called Here and Now, the Autobiography of Pat Martino, which came out um, on uh, Backbeat Publishing. Was it 2015? Uh, man, 2011? Might have been 2015. I'd have to check. Uh, but that was more bonding with Pat. And, you know, uh, so I, I got to be great friends with him over time through all of these various scenarios, producing, uh, just hanging out at his gigs, writing liner notes, and ultimately writing this book with him. Yeah. You know, and, and for the book, he wanted it really, his impetus for writing this book was he wanted it to be a self-help book to help other musicians because he had gotten himself together with regards to health and eating correctly. And just philosophically, he, he had things to bestow onto people, you know, and he wanted it to be like a self-help book. So I had to constantly pull him back to reality when he started getting a little uh, esoteric. Uh, he might get off into a rant about something, not a rant, but just a philosophizing and I'd I'd uh, pull him back to reality by saying uh Pat what kind of shoes did Jack McDuff have when you were playing gigs up there in Harlem you know and that would begin like a whole process of vivid detailed memory if you jogged his memory you could go there uh and he described it very brilliantly one time as you know because it was said that he lost his memory and had to relearn how to play the instrument well, to a degree, it was a, it was more about memory memory recovery uh, with the 
part of the brain that was affected in his aneurysm. Right. Uh, it was a process of recovering memory of faces of relatives. Like when right. he woke up from the surgery, he didn't recognize his parents. Right. Let alone this instrument, the guitar. Yeah. So gradually over time, he started reacquainting himself with that instrument and with the process of playing. And he told me a story once about uh, he was at the Blue Note. Now, this is some years after his comeback, and he's fully into his Blue Note recordings by now. And he played a gig. Uh, and after the gig, he went upstairs to the green room. There's a knock on the door, and it's Joe Pesci at the door going, oh. oh, Pat, that was a great set. I really loved it. You sounded so great. And Pat's like, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, And Pesci pauses and goes, you don't remember me, do you? And he's like, well, of course, <laughs> you're Joe Pesci, a good fellow, a great actor. No, 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 no. I was the bartender at Small's Paradise when you played there with, with McDuff. And I'll tell you what you used to order. You used to order grasshoppers. And Pat said, the sound of that word, grasshopper, and the, the taste of the grass, it opened a door and it flooded with memories. So of that place in that time. And then he started right. reminiscing. But so for him, recovering memory was a process of opening these doors in his brain, these doors right. in his memory, and uh, certain words or a smell or a taste or something like that would trigger it. And for me to say, what kind of shoes did Jack McDuff have triggered his memories of having that gig at Small's Paradise back in the day? You know, that's, that's, that's just beyond incredible. What an amazing, really, I'm not, what an amazing, amazing story. You know, I, um, we've been at this for about an hour. Oh, and um, which is great because I feel like we're just getting started. But what I really want to do is put a pause on this. We got a great segment here. Unbelievable, man. I can't thank you enough. I mean, there's, there's nobody like you, Bill. <laughs> I, mean, I haven't even told you about seeing Hendrix in 1970. I, well, you're going to. I hope you will. <laughs> I, I, I swear, I saw Hendrix three times. Oh, oh, that's right. You're an old man. I forgot. Yeah, you got to remember. You know, I mean, we're talking about, uh, where do we go here? Uh, And then Mitch would do, but of it, you know, and all that, you know. Yeah, I can play. I can play a lot of that first record, you know. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, I, I will say a couple things about Pat. You know, I, I, I used to buy all those video, you know, the the videotapes that he made. You know, the instructional thing. I went through them many, many times, and and he was big on the the parental thing, and he would get this, you know, that his concepts were always, you know, astrophysics. You know, it was just right. crazy. And uh, it was great. And I he played the Velvet Note, I think, in 19, I mean, no, 2000, maybe 2000, because he, he died in, in uh, 20, no, I mean, 2020, I think, because he died in 21. And um, and I so I sat and talked to him. I was I'm on, I'm on the board of advisors of the Velvet Note. It's a jazz club in Atlanta. And I was sitting there with him and um, he was using a Marshall 412 cabinet. Wow. Um, and he had, he, he, I, I can't remember, the, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the, of the drummer that was playing with him. But I went up to him after the, kind of after the gig, I said, man, you're, you're, you're earning your money, aren't you? <laughs> he laughed at me. Because, <laughs> because Pat's time was so good. Oh, yeah. That he was, he was, you know, usually the bass players defining stuff and everybody's kind of playing. You know, his time, he, I mean, he was the timekeeper in that group. I mean, you know, I mean, his, he, he did unbelievable. And, and he, and the reason he used a 412 cabinet, it was like he, his guitar in that room with that Marshall 412 sounded like a kick drum with pitch. I mm. mean, every note, bum, 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 you know, and it was just, it was, it was amazing. And I sat down and talked to him while he was having whatever he was having. And I got to tell you, I was nervous for him because, he had he must have weighed about 87 pounds and um he was i mean very lucid very talkative you know and all that great guy you know a good hang and you do his voice very very well but man that was a that was that was a i, I went because the last guy and i and I, I don't want to end this on a down note because it's not but the last guy that i was around that was that thin 
was my dad. Wow. And my dad, I, I, I went out to dinner with my dad two weeks before he passed away and he, he was getting out of the car and his pant leg came up. And it was like, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't any bigger than, you know, than my wrist, his, his whole leg, you know? And that's the way Pat looked, you know, he just had he had no weight on him at all. But man, what well, an... it, he was always very slight, yeah, even always. in the 70s. That. And, you know, he had emphysema. Yeah. Uh, when we did that album, when we were in Marin County with uh, Michael Hedges, there was a moment when we walked up a hill and he was like out of breath, you know, and he could never carry his own guitar. We had to carry it for him because he really... He he was doing a, a steroidal inhaler all the time. And uh, so, man, that was like, you know, 96. And he he passed many years later. So he continued right. with that challenge, with that physical challenge. Right. Uh, Maybe, but he was right. a very, very, very beloved uh, figure. One, one more imitation of Pat. Uh, when we did this session, uh this was one with Mike Stern and you know how Pat's tone is notoriously let's say warm muted you know right. a little muffled we tried to get him to turn up the treble a little we tried to turn up the treble on his guitar yeah because he was playing with Mike Stern and his guitar was so muffled that velvet quality the velvet fog you know yeah. And he turns to me and he says, I must have my level of comfort. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want that fucking treble, man. He wanted what he wanted. You know, uh, I we we reviewed recently uh his his uh Benedetto guitar, the last one that he was playing. And I gotta tell you, uh I I got that guitar in my hands with his string set up. Oh yeah. So which I, you know, I said, who the hell can play this damn thing? Yeah. I mean, yes. I go, you know, it's, you know, so uh, for people that don't know, he, I think he had a 16 or an 18 on top. I mean, the rest of the set was fairly normal, but the B and the E string were really, 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 really high. For somebody that slight to be yeah. able to play. I have no idea. That is unbelievable. And and that with that dexterity and that, that, that articulation and that accuracy and, and the time and, it, I, I I probably didn't want to shake hands with him on his on his on his left hand because he probably would have crushed it. I mean that, <laughs> but um, un, unbelievable. And then we put elevens on it when and us mere mere mortals could actually play it. But uh, oh, yeah. unbelievably great guitar. Um, I I please 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 I want to thank you so much for for what we've got so far. Let's do this again maybe next month. We I want to get into this whole Hendrix thing. And I mean you 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 know. I, I don't even know where to begin to thank you, man. I, I really don't. Beautiful. Uh, it's like part one. We should definitely part continue. one, brother. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, I'm talking about Joe Pass. You know, yeah. we got Coriel. We got all the sco. Come on. Yeah, no, I'm saying, hey, listen, this is Bob Baker to <laughs> jazz guitar today with Bill Milkowski, and and Bill. I, I, as I've said many times, I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm just a guy that <laughs> decided to want to do something. Bill's the real deal. Bill is not only is he the real deal, he'll, he's the real deal with with all of the bells and whistles, man. So to have you here talking about these guys, man, I am so grateful and so thankful. So I'm going to say thanks to you. Uh, please, by the right. way, if you like this content, please subscribe like share follow hit the bell the whole help us out with the youtube algorithms subscribe to the magazine everything is free we don't charge for anything that we do here help grow and support this community um and we would really really appreciate that more than i can tell you we are growing we continue to grow every month and uh and we've been here this is our sixth year of doing this and i i gotta tell you you talk about making a lot of money in the uh you know, in the uh, in the contract, the journalism business. <laughs> yeah, we're not going there. We're not going there. So the gig economy. There you can go. I make a, can I make a pitch? Of course. My, I have a website, BillMulkowski.com. And I also have a Substack column. And I write about a lot of stuff about people that I have known and written books about Jaco Pastorius and 
Pat Martino and Michael Brecker uh, and all that stuff, uh, as well as whatever is uh, my my blog is called The Milkman's Musings. Uh, the Milkman, that's a nickname I got in New Orleans when I was the overnight DJ on WWOZ from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. The milkman making his late overnight deliveries. The milkman, I love it. You bro. dig, you dig. I dig it. I dig it. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> huge fan, Bill. Bob Baker for jazz guitar today with Bill Milkowski. To be continued, my friend. To be continued. All right, man. Bye bye. Carry now. on. Bye bye.